with spring coming to a close and the upcoming summer, it looks like all-in-ones are all the rage. This new one has just landed for review. This is the DNA Alpha Pro Amp DAC Pre Combo for those of you who like a very clean desk, a small unit and something that can manage most headphones. Coming in at a decent price that doesn't break the bank with some interesting functionality. Shall we have a look? Hi, I'm Koji CEO. Welcome to Convince Me Audio. It looks like it's the AIO season. Let's begin. Thank you goes out to Shenzhen Audio for sending this unit in for review and assessment. And as always, we do not sign any waivers, we do not accept cash. Every opinion that comes across this channel is directly from myself, if that is of any value to you. So, you get quite a hefty box. I believe this unit's around $700, but please check down below for the latest pricing. Yeah, it's a nice box. Reminds me very much of the top-in sort of styling design. It's got some weight behind it. Some instructions here. Oh, that's really nice. It's embossed as well. Yeah, I like that. Comes in a jacket too. We are being fancy, aren't we? Let's have a look. Full specification scrolling down the screen here for you. Whilst I am unpacking this uh, monster, we get an AC power supply, which we don't need, and we get a USB-C to A. That's fascinating. So it looks like no USB-B here for those of you old school boys. So this is gonna be very easy to use with your iPhones, etc. I've got a lot to say about the iPhone as a source, uh, especially coming to the latest iPhones, the 16 Pro Max, for example. No remote control, sadly. That's quite important and you don't have one. So this is the chassis, nicely constructed. We've got vents on either side, as you can see here and here to dissipate heat, the underside, just some writing and some rubber feet. And this is the unit itself. It's quite small, not a bad design. Looking at the rear of the unit first, pointing towards you guys, AC cutoff switch. And then we have a Bluetooth antenna. Obviously it's inbuilt within the system itself. That's really good. You do have none of that little pokey outy bit here, which is wonderful. USB-C, this can support 32-bit 768 and uh, DSD-512. They're using the ES9039MS Pro chip, the latest from ESS, a Delta Sigma, obviously. Nice, that's not bad. Then we have optical, SPDIF, uh, coax, XLR, out, balanced, single-ended, at single-ended. And also we have something interesting here, analog in. This is for your turntable or other peripherals that require such things. That's really cool. You don't often see that on devices sub $1,000. I like that a lot. Front of the unit, we have a very stiff action volume pot. This is an analog volume pot. Thank you, no digital here. This is actually done very, very nicely and the resistance is very good. And obviously we've got LED indicators as can be seen with the unit switched on as you go up in volume. I like that a lot. Then we have on the other side, we're gonna to come to the middle in a minute, balanced four pin XLR, quarter inch jack 6.3 obviously for single ended and Pentacon 4.4. We have a screen and then we have four buttons. Let me turn this around towards myself so I can actually see what I'm doing metaphorically. So first button on the left is on and off, gives you a relay click indicating it's on standby. Then we have the medium, low and high gain. For some reason it randomizes this, it's really bizarre. It doesn't do it in order. <laughs> so be, be careful with that. And then we have pre, line out and headphones. I'm gonna come back to that in two seconds. That's really important and I'm angry as hell. Then we have obviously USB, optical, coax, lining, corresponding. Oh, and Bluetooth as well. Bluetooth is here is 5.1. LDAC and all the relevant codecs are supported, not 5.4 sadly. The lossless Bluetooth functionality. I wish more manufacturers would implement this seeing as these units are brand new, but uh, there you are. You've got 5.1 here. Okay, what did I wanna yell about? The uh, pre line out and headphone button for. So 
When you have this unit connected to speakers, as I did during testing for the pre-output Genelec 1029As, the active monitors on my work desk obviously have no volume control, so you use this to control the volume, seeing as it's a very good pot for this line of equipment sub $1,000. To be fair, those speakers are way more in performance than what this delivers, but it's been there and I've been using it and it's been fine. It's the fact that you go to pre headphones and woe be tied, you forget that music is playing on your headphones. You take the headphones off and you press it to go straight to speakers thinking you're gonna turn this down and you'll be all right. Because if you don't look at the very, 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 very faint writing on the buttons, corresponding lights, etc., for the menus, you will go to direct line out and boom. Having direct line out in between pre and headphones is a bad, bad idea when you're trying to control active speakers and you don't shut the speakers off or switch them off or you forget and you're playing music from one and then you jump to the other. The other way around is fine. Obviously, if you're on speakers, you go to headphones and you go to pre, you can deal with that. But the direct line now, you need to change this in software, ASAP DNA, by holding it for five seconds should indicate some LED light flashing and then go to direct to line out. You should not have it cycle through this. That's very dangerous. So please be aware of that. Two, if this unit is connected to USB and is connected to your active monitors and you're cycling through USB, optical, and for the reason I was using optical in was I had it connected to the monitor. It's the LG 42 inch C2 OLED, which we use as our monitor, obviously, for other types of media consumption, like YouTube, etc., For example, if you want the speakers and you want to use this as a pre, you get a clonk every single time you change the menu. And even turning down the volume didn't seem to help. You still get that clunk crunch every single time you go from USB to Bluetooth to uh, yada, yada, yada. Please bear that in mind too. Okay, those are my two gripes that I think covers everything. This is the unit. It's very cute. It's very compact. It's fully discrete in its amplification. We have a bank of resistors in here, very nice. Analog volume pot, femto clock oscillators. I think we've got three of those. A second PLL clock here as well. A lot of very interesting things under the hood, except that Bluetooth 5.1. That is something I'm not really happy about because I think 5.4 should be the standard now. A linear power supply, I think, in this unit as well. This is a very good unit that outputs six watts into 32 ohms. But what are the problems and what does it sound like and will it fit your listening criteria? Why don't I pull down some headphones off of the wall for you and then we can have a chat. So, first things first. Hi Feynman says Varas on the beautiful Abyss stands. This can make sounds on this unit. The unit itself fundamentally is a very warm, laid back, soft sounding device. In fact, it's kind of surprising how close it sounds to the Philix Audio Echo, the OTL tube amplifier sub $1,000. If you want an OTL amp sub $1,000 in the solid state form, this will give you that. It's a little bit gooey, it's a little bit sticky, it's got a nice dynamic range, bottomless base, fixed stage, like mirror, and it doesn't change shape. That's very fixed. All of your tracks will have the same shape for the stage. It's not very dynamic there, but everything that happens vertically and horizontally within this stage is extremely dynamic. Very clear, very clean, and yet quite warm sounding. It can't drive Sasvaras. Sorry, the, uh, no, you can go over there. It makes noises on this thing. I think you can get away with it, it's fine, but it'll probably sound like a depleted Aria organic. That's the best analogy I can give you. It collapses the stage, it doesn't have the weight and heft, it, it, it doesn't have the power, current, and drivability in the power supply, though it's a six watt unit for this device, but this is still a, what is it, four and a half, five thousand dollar headphone, 
I mean, the unveiled over there is 8,000. We That probably does better on this than this one does. This one's hard to drive. So it's our reference. That's why we use it. Anyway, let's forget about that. I think if you're buying this, you don't, you're not going to really care about Sesvaras. You're going to mostly care about the Aria unveiled review here. The beautiful Poet, possibly, if you can afford this and get hold of this, the review just completed. And if it comes out before this, it's here for you too. This does a much, much better job because it's less demanding. It's about 55 ohms, 101 dB sensitivity, but not only that, it gives you nice bottomless bass, very punchy, impactful mid bass, nice upper bass response that doesn't bleed into the mid range. I mean, we are almost sort of describing the characteristics of the Poet, but the Poet is a very sort of like a reference sound, sort of neutral, very understated sound, but this makes it warm. This does give it a little bit of that tubiness that is really surprising how warm this thing sounds. And it does get a little bit toasty, so please bear that in mind. Listening to electronic music with a Poet was, I think, a nice experience. For some reason, a warm headphone, such as this one, this is the Meze 105 Air, I didn't like this. This is a warm headphone in itself and in its own characteristics, and it just made it sound gooey, sticky, a bit overly aggressive in the region around six to seven to eight kilohertz, and it was just a bit, sharp and warm and not detailed all at the same time. Blah. Go over there. You don't count either. But for something like the Poet in the mid-tier flagship category, if if this is a unit that you want to live with you, or something neutral, bright, like the Aria Unveiled, which is quite easy to drive, to be fair, or something like the Sivga line, or the Sendi Iva 2, or the... Oh, that, that was a little bit too aggressive in the treble region. I think it had a tendency to overly sharpen around 6 to 7k. I wasn't really a big fan of that. But it does have authority and weight, so it, it does seems to exaggerate the aspects of a headphone that is already there in its characteristics, like the Sivga SP2 Pro um, review here. It's a little bit sharp and sp spicy, I think is a better terminology for that. And it does tend to highlight that a little bit and it's just a bit fatiguing. To be honest with you, the most flagship type of headphone that sounded the best on this was the mid-tier flagship Poet or the Aria Unveiled. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? Well, it basically tells us that if you have an overly warm headphone, I don't recommend this unit because it's a little bit laid back, it's a little bit soft and it's a little bit too much. But if you have a neutral bright headphone, a reference sounding headphone, this does a very, very good job. To summarize, this is a warm leaning sounding unit. Buy it if you predominantly have neutral, neutral bright, less warm, less laid back headphones. And it will work nicely with that. It will synergize very well with it. With the warmer aspect of headphones, it will just lean into that. Some of you might love that. I do not. It's not my preference. Something like the 105 Air, which is already warm leaning. This just made it gooey and sticky and like one of those nights at 36 degrees when you just can't sleep and to whichever way you turn, you're just assaulted by stickiness. So that wasn't a happy listening experience for me, but on something like the Poet, I was doing work. I was very, very happy with this headphone and this unit. Very, very nice. Did a good job. Is there better in the $700 category? Yes, there is. But it can't drive the stuff that this can as much as something like this, for example. It does a better job, and that is the Cord Mojo 2. Okay, it doesn't have 4-pin XLR, it's single-ended through and through, but it does have optical in, it does have coax in, in 3.5 form, and you can upsample to 768. It has USB-C, and it can do 32-bit 768, and it's the size of my palm. It has crossfeed, and it has parametric EQ, which is outstanding on it. So should you go for the Mojo 2 or this? This will drive bigger headphones better. The Mojo 2 annihilates it for sound. It's not even comparable. And that's the D and A Alpha Pro in a nutshell. If you like reviews such as this, consider joining Patreon, where all of your donation, support, and enthusiasm drives me to do more and more reviews, helps to pay the bills and the cameraman and the editors, and keeps the channel going. Otherwise, a like, a share, and a comment or two down below is all I require from you. 
and tell me about your setup. What do you like listening to? I love our community. I love the amazing viewers we have built over the last four and a half years. I think we have touch wood, nothing goes mad. Some of the best comment sections on YouTube period. And I do appreciate the kind words, the adult conversations and genuinely the audience we have. You have no idea how toxic some channel comment sections can be. So I deeply appreciate that. You make my job fun. And if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to get to you. The best way is through the Telegram chat. Otherwise, I'll usually peruse through the YouTube comment section. I don't neglect it. Until the next one. Peace.